Hello violinists, welcome to Brian Strings. I'm Henrietta and I'm delighted to host this live broadcast for you today. So I'm loving it that I'm seeing that there are already some viewers here uh, and I would like to wish you a warm welcome and I'm hoping that we're going to have a, a, a class as we're usually having it. It's nice and relaxed and um, members of Henriette's Violin Club can ask me any violin related questions. Now before we get started properly, uh, uh, let me explain to you how this works. For those of you who've never been here before, um, you see a chat box somewhere in your screen and there in my on my chat box it says enter message here. So if you want to ask a question, you can write your question in that chat box and then hit the send button when you hit the send button I get to see it at my end and I'll be honest with you I'll try to answer any question however difficult <laughs> to the best of my ability so we usually start by practicing how that works so why did you write in this in the chat message right now where you are maybe your name and uh, where you live how long you've been playing the violin for so that is just meant to have a little bit of a practice how this works so you feel comfortable um, reading other people's messages and also adding to the conversation yourselves and when we've done that then we'll get start properly so where are you um i'll give you the example my name is henriette as you may know and i'm living in norwich in the uk and that is where i'm um, streaming you from today so norwich uk is where i am so where are you guys? Let me know when you're here, uh, how you're doing and how long you've been playing the violin and where you live. And usually in this class we get people from all over the world and it's just lovely for me to see, um, not only to hear your questions and to see what what um, is on your mind as a violin player, uh, but just to see where people are all across the world. So who's going to go first? That's always the most difficult moment, isn't it? Now, it's okay. There are no wrong questions that you can ask. There are people who sometimes come to this class who haven't even started to play the violin, who just want some reassurance that we're here to look after everyone who is doing their best getting going. Um, so that's absolutely fine. If you're a little bit further advanced, good on you. Perhaps you've come across an issue in your violin playing that you might ask a question about. And maybe you are a lot more advanced and you've got a lot more advanced a question. That's also good because people who have not yet got the experience like you have in your violin, in your violin, in their violin playing, they will also be able to benefit from the conversation that we're having. So once someone is first, it will all get a lot easier, isn't it? So go on then, if you're not already writing in the chat box. Let me see what is there. I'm actually delighted that we're having this class today because um, I've just returned from a holiday and I'm refreshed and uh, ready to take this class and I always really enjoy doing these classes. They take place about once a month and uh, usually towards the end of the month but towards the end of this class we will discuss what is the best date for you guys as well to uh, attend next uh, at the end of November so we can see when it is. I don't know yet when it is. We'll get the diaries out a bit later on. Now then, whilst that is all ongoing, I have recently had a question from somebody who's who's emailed me actually to say, can I talk a little bit about the left hand pinky? And the left hand pinky for many violinists is sometimes a tricky one. Um, so let's think about it. And maybe you've come across the, um, a moment in your playing where you thought that left hand pinky is really stiff or it is, I can't really place it in the correct way. Let me show you what a left hand pinky can do. Now, um, there are many different aspects to a left hand finger and 
a, a little finger doesn't necessarily have to go round. You know that all your other fingers have to go round on the string. Let me see if that is what it, is the easiest angle for you to see. I was just going in reverse order for me. That's difficult. Um, there we are. This is better. But your pinky can either go round and for some little fingers that are a bit longer, which is like mine, it's easier to go round. But some people have got a little bit smaller a little finger, a little bit shorter a little finger, I should say, and it can only go, and the pinky of those people can only go flat like this and go straight like that. And that's also fine. There are a lot of violin schools actually that promote a little finger that, to go flat because the good thing is if you drop it from your bass knuckle from here, it can go onto the string and really slap on. And you might hear this, you can hear it clatter on the string. Can you hear that? And when you're able to put your pinky down and it makes a little rattling noise, you get a really well-defined note. So that's a good thing in violin playing. So if you find you find it tricky to place your, your little finger round on the string, it's perfectly fine to place it straight. But as I said, you need to make sure that you drop it down from the bass knuckle. So you want, don't want to go like this way. I find it difficult to do now. Okay, but you want to go then from here, lift it up straight and put it down straight as well. I don't know who, who here in my audience today has got their violin ready whilst you are listening to this uh, live stream. That would be quite useful so you can go and get your violin quickly if you haven't yet got it and you can try it along you can try it along with me and see if it might work like that so for some people it works like this and for other people it works like that and your fingers your pinky might come down more rounded so you can still see that i'm dropping it from the bass knuckle can you see my pinky today is actually super cold so that's why it clicks a little bit Okay, so that is good. Lifting it up and placing it more round. Okay, or straightening it and placing it down flat. Now, what happens to your fingertip when you place it flatter? You cover a greater area. If you put your fingers down round like that, the area, the tip of your pinky that touches the string is slightly smaller. So you would think that you would be able to play slightly better in tune when you've got a, a smaller area of fingertip that touches the string. So that is something to consider when you place your finger, when you place your pinky more flat on the string, you cover a wider area and also you're perhaps touching the string with your fingertip, not actually the pointy bit at the at the tip of your finger but more the flat part more this bit here um, and that requires a bit more accuracy in tuning so whether you place your finger here or whether you place your finger there makes a difference for the tuning has anybody come across um, an issue with their pinky or can you tell me whether you play with a rounded pinky or whether you play with a flatter pinky let me hear what you all think. Anyone today wanting to make a comment? <laughs> Nobody wants to make a comment. That's also good. Okay, whilst we're waiting for our fourth, first question to come along, let me tell you something, uh, something really exciting, which is new. Uh, you may have come across my website, proamstrings.com, and uh, you may also know that I've got an Amazon shop where I show uh, in the shop my preferred products, so books that I tend to use and instruments that I prefer over other instruments. Um, but nowadays the shop is migrating to the website. So if you live in the US, you are having um, a, uh, you are having um, your first the first view of this because most of the shop is now live in the US and the computer or the website I should say recognizes where you live and it shows you the US page if you are in the US 
UK customers will have to wait a couple more weeks uh, before the UK shop is also live. But if you are in the US, you can now see my Amazon shop on my website. And that is just to make things a little bit easier because I think it is easier to remember the web address and there are links to my website on my YouTube channel as well. So if you need any violin related products, you can find them on my website. Now, that's for those in the US. And for those in the UK and the rest of the world, that they, they, you'll have to wait just one or two more weeks and it will gradually be populated with more and more products. So I'm quite excited about that because um, I, I'm always in the process of trying to make things a little bit easier for you guys, my clients, and I'm hoping that this is a big step in the right direction. Can you all hear me, by the way? Tell me if you can't hear me. <laughs> I'm hoping you can. Since there are still eight viewers here, I would assume that is working. Now then, let me tell you uh, something else that is new and it has started about two weeks ago. Ah, hello, Kirsi. Kirsi? Um, I'm so pleased to see someone here and it is much nicer for me to actually talk to a person rather than talk to a machine. So thank you for writing in the chat box and you are now a member of Henriette's Violin Club and that's lovely to see. Very welcome and it's lovely to see you here. So where are you from? That sounds Finnish to me. I'm not quite sure but um, let me know where you're from. Now, I, was, I, was, I just started to uh, talk to you about another new uh, initiative and that is the Violin Clinic. And that is a new series of videos that is going to start actually from, well, it's already started actually, but um, it's going to start properly with um, a client's video in it on Friday, this next, so a week today, it will be um, launched uh, on the YouTube channel and this is an, a, one of the ways that I'm trying to interact with my YouTube audience and that is something that you may know I'm quite passionate about. Um, I know that social media is sometimes very much a one-way thing from the social media uh, channel to the person who uses it but I would like it to be more a sort of general social interaction and therefore I've started a violin clinic where you as the client can write, uh, send me a little video with something that bothers you that you might want a video on. Um, and if you send me a little video with your question, I will build a video around it and I will try to answer that question. And that video is going to stay on the YouTube channel in the playlist Violin Clinic. So um, you can send me a video of no longer than one minute and you can send it to my email address, which is um, info at proamstrings.com. I'll just write that in here. Let me put my violin aside. Oh, if I can write it at proamstrings.com and you can send your video there and then I will listen to it obviously and and make my video so that it answers your question. So send me your video with your question of no longer than one minute. And obviously you must be happy for me to incorporate your video in mine. And uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to use it. That depends on the question very much. All of it or a section of it. And um, we will see. And you get to feature in my videos of the violin clinic. So, is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? And now is your chance to ask the question, which I can then answer, try and answer. Yes, I'm from Finland, adult beginner on lesson 13 May song. Now, I, as you know, you may have been here before. As you know, I have got huge respect for you guys. Uh, who are learning the violin by themselves. 
the violin in itself is a challenging instrument to learn and I'm sure that everyone here agrees on that. Um, and then if you are trying to learn that by yourself by following instructions on videos and many of you are doing a fabulous job um, I am I am in awe of you because that is difficult to do uh, but it is very much possible uh, because occasionally people get to have uh, one or more private lessons with me as a result of them learning on YouTube and I am always astounded at how well you guys do and how well you listen to instructions. So really, really, really well done. And if you're uh, on lesson 13, you are well on your way. So congratulations with your progress. Excellent. So have you come across anything that you thought, oh, just explain that to me a little bit more? Do write in the comment section and then I can answer your question. Anybody else wants to ask a question? Now, whilst we wait for your questions to come through, a question that I get asked really often is to just repeat the notes on the D string. And that seems to be something that people uh, want to have a bit more information on. Now, the notes on the D string, uh, when you're a beginner, and I'm... I'm Assuming for now that most of you here are sort of early learners, shall we say. Um, the notes on the D string are called D. This is the open D string. Sounds like that. And when you place your first finger on the D string, it's called E. Then the second finger on the D string, this one, is called F sharp. The third finger is called G and then we can have the fourth finger which is called A and the fourth finger being called A of course sound, should sound the same as the open A string you see so we've got D that's D sharp G A and then I'll go down G F sharp E D so that is a, a question that I hear very very often but that doesn't mean that there are all the notes that you can come across on this section of the D string um, let me play you what's called a chromatic scale and there I will play you all the semitones up until the fourth finger, the A. So then I'm having a D. A half step higher than the D is an E flat. Sounds like this. Then a half step higher again is that E that we've learned before. If I place my second finger close to the first finger, it's F. Another half step higher is F sharp. That's the one that we've come across earlier. A semitone higher, a half step higher again is G. And now I can raise that G by a half step, by a semitone. And I raise my third finger, G sharp. And here's my A. So that will sound... See, and now I play from an open D string to the fourth finger on D, but not step by step, but I play all these half steps. Now, when you first start learning to play the violin, it's far too complicated to learn all these half steps, these semitone steps. Uh, and we're learning first a whole step from D to E, then a whole step from E to F sharp, and then a semi step, a half step from F sharp to G and then a whole step again from G to A. Now in music, all the letters of the alphabet are a semitone, a half step apart. So, uh, uh, sorry, let me say that again, that is not right. In music, all the letters of the alphabet are a step, a whole tone apart, except for two. There are two exceptions to that rule. From B to C, and from E to F, they are half steps. Those two you must remember, B to C 
and E to F. If you play the piano or you have a piano or you can find a picture of a piano, then you will see that between E to F and between B to C, there are two white keys right next to one another without there being a black one in between them. And though that is because, and that is just a natural phenomenon that's to do with, um, uh, with physics, um, uh, those two notes are a semitone apart. But for us as violin players, it's much easier to play a space between our fingers. So here, you see, and I'm going not to F that we've talked about here, which was the half step, but I'm going to F sharp, you see. Now, when I use a new finger, the third finger, that is easy. That, this is just a pattern of how we learn, first of all. F sharp to G is a half step, and then I've got a whole step again there. Okay, now, I'm hoping that clarifies things and doesn't muddle things in your head. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question? Otherwise, I'd be rattling on about the things that I come across in my practice and there is enough to keep you occupied. But, you know, I'd much rather be more specific and answer any questions that you may have. <laughs> it may be one of those days that all the members of Henriette's Violin Club are at work and that, that sometimes works and that sometimes is the case, so that's okay. Um, another question that I sometimes come across in my teaching practice is why do we hold the bow we hold, the way we hold the bow? Why is that such a complicated bow hold? Um, and I'll tell you something about it. Why is this such a complicated bow hold with a bent thumb and then your thumb opposite your middle finger and then these two fingers here together and then a gap here and a gap here and a gap here. Sorry, I'm seeing this in um, as a mirror image. <laughs> I'm getting a bit confused. There we are. Okay, why is that so, such a complicated bow hold? Now we're holding the bow um, and the bow hold should really be a sort of balance. Remember, your violin is here, pretend it is, and it is resting on the string. And this way, my fingers can all be very, very floppy. And the bow hold is a balance, really, between my thumb and my string. Can you imagine my violin resting on my string here? Can you see? It doesn't fall down to the floor. And the other fingers... So your, you, the ring between your thumb and your middle finger is really what holds the violin and stops it from falling onto the floor. The other fingers are all used for steering the bow. Now you can perhaps see there is a little bit of a seesaw between my index finger and my pinky. Look, it's seesawing on my thumb. It's pivoting on my thumb. Can you see that? And if I press down on my pinky a little bit more, the point of the bow goes up. And if I move down on my index finger a little bit more, the heel of my bow goes up, you see? So this is an exercise that you guys might be doing at home because it's a very useful skill to try to feel that balance. Now, when you're first learning to play the violin, that's incredibly difficult to do. But it is one that is very, very important because it depends on how much weight you want to put into your violin what sort of balance you have in your bow hold. You see, I can play with less pressure and I'm demonstrating that to you and I'm exaggerating. So I'm lifting the bow off the string as it were, or I can play with more pressure if I squeeze it down more. Can you see that? So that is one thing. Another aspect is I can steer the bow sideways. So I can go, if I show you this way, my fingers can move the bow from left to right. Can you see that? By going sideways like this. And this is the reason why your pinky here should be on the side edge of the bow and not on the top, because then you can't push it sideways, you see? So my pinky is on the side edge. So not there, but it's there. So there's my second way that I can move the bow. And my third variation is I can roll the bow between my fingers. Can you see this? 
and you can practice it with me um, and when I do that I can choose to play more on this side of the hair or I can roll it over and play more on the other side of the hair and that is going to give me a very different sound effect now of course when you are just learning to play the violin we're all very happy when you can hold the bow in a softish way but as soon as you start to develop and um, we've just seen that Kersey is um, on lesson 13 you may start to soften that bow hold and the moment you start to soften it up and don't squeeze it too hard when you play then your possibilities for creating a more varied sound are starting are starting to come so hello richard hello rob sorry um welcome here someone's pop just popped in so lovely to see you here rob gregor richard who's saying hello now i can't remember where you live but somewhere in the us i think isn't it okay so we're just talking about ways to manipulate the bow and creating different sound effects so that is why we have the bow hold that we have now let me just have oh he's from denmark so have we got scandinavia here look we've got finland and denmark that's lovely to see you really really good so kirsty kirsty has said you started with a four four violin but you i think i need a seven eight size you make a perfectly valid point there um, of course we tend to think that children play on smaller instruments but actually in my uh, violin studio there are a number of adults who play on smaller violins as well and I'll show you how you can measure whether the violin is the right size for you and what we usually do is we measure if you can put your hand around the scroll here and um, you should still have quite a good bend here in your elbow so if you feel that you're going round the scroll of your violin and your arm is nearly straight your uh, your instrument is definitely too big now if you go round the scroll and you've got a very narrow gap here so you've got a very small angle oh my goodness i'm trying to see that in um as a mirror image so if this is a very small angle here then your violin is too small and you want to be at about a 90 degree angle i would say maybe slightly bigger but not much um what does that mean if you play on an instrument which is too big not only have you got a hinge which is longer so which is much more tiring to play because your instrument as it were is further away from your body um, but also all the spaces between your fingers are a little bit bigger okay so <clears throat> excuse me there is a point where you can't play your fingers wide enough if you have to play maybe a tone and a half between two fingers uh, and then your instrument you should really change your instrument to a four to a seven eight or maybe a three quarter size but um, seven eight violins exist they are just a little bit bigger than the six eight the three quarter size um, and and that might well be easier for you now why would people go for a seven eight instrument and not for a three quarter size and that is all to do with the sound the larger the instrument is the more volume it produces there's no second <laughs> no two ways about it so uh, you might try a 7-8 violin and there are some really beautiful sounding 7-8 violins because if you play on a violin which is slightly too big it's just very very tiring for the fingers uh, especially but also for your left shoulder and for your left arm because that weight is is just too far away from your body <clears throat> rob says i'm 158 and small hands i've got a 4-4 violin it takes time to get used to it says rob yes rob that is that is true and um of course you you will build stamina 
but if you have the option of getting a slightly smaller violin it would make your life a lot easier if you played on a slightly smaller instrument how do we know then that the instrument is too small and that is very easy to tell because when your fingers can't actually um, fit nicely together and you always have to move a finger away before you can put the next one down and still play in tune that is when you can see that your instrument is too small and of course that also depends on the width of your fingers some people have very thin fingers thin and long fingers whereas other people have got shorter and chubbier fingers so uh, it's not entirely to do with how tall you are and how long your arms are but also what kind of fingers you have there are some people who've got very very tiny fingertips and they might get away with playing on a slightly smaller instrument and find it lighter to play and find it easier whereas other people have got bigger hands and they would prefer the larger violins and then we come to another point which is what kind of personality you are in general are you more outgoing type or are you really a bit more sort of to yourself would you like to play on a cannon of an instrument in which case you'd go for the slightly bigger one if you are a little bit more introverted maybe then you might opt to play on a slightly smaller instrument which is a little bit softer and more delicate sometimes in sound ah rob says i had the same doubt and tried on a luthier's violin the sound was completely different I thought it was carved, though it was carved there. Oh yes, violins, they sound completely different um, one to the next. And that is because nothing on a violin is ever standardised. So your violin might be a full size, but my full size violin might be a millimetre or two longer or shorter than my next door neighbour's full size violin and then the blades the front and the belly the belly and the back of the violin might be slightly thinner or slightly thicker and then the neck might be set in slightly differently uh, and that again then sounds completely different and what people also find is that the feel of the neck here so what you feel with your thumb in particular um, how big the thumb uh, how big the neck of the violin is and how thick the ribs are that's this bit here makes a huge difference so you might have a slightly bigger size violin which is slightly thinner in that the ribs here are slightly shorter so the front and, and back are slightly closer together mind you we're talking millimeters here it, it feels completely different so if you're in doubt, uh, Kirsty, go to a violin maker, a reputable shop near you where you can try different instruments and you will find one that you like and some people take longer and some people take a lot shorter to buy a violin that they actually like. Um, I took a very, very long time before I got my violin and this was when I was uh, cons at the Rotterdam Conservatoire and I played on my own, on my old student violin that I played on all the time, which my parents used to have in their loft uh, because my granddad used to play and my mother used to play. And when I arrived at the conservatory, they said, well, you need to upgrade your instrument because um, you're going to do different things and you need an instrument which sounds really well and yours is just not going to give you back what you put in. So it was time to look for a different instrument and I wanted an instrument that was very sweet sounding and uh, all the violins that I came across were just really bold sounding and I didn't like that so much and I looked and looked and it came up to looking for two years and my teacher said oh for goodness sake you'd need a new instrument <laughs> and uh, he was then part of the Amsterdam String Quartet and um, he was um, having he used to play on a Guadagnini violin, which he had on loan from an elderly lady. And the elderly lady at some point passed away and the family wanted the instrument back so he could no longer play it. And he had a violin made by the person in Amsterdam, which I'm, I'm playing the violin of now. Uh, and he'd made 
four instruments that fitted really well together. So he'd made two violins, a cello and a, and um, a viola. So in the same sort of, with the same sort of timbre, so that this quartet would sound really, really similar. And then after their first concert, the violin, the violin maker had been invited to come and listen to the quartet of his instruments. And he said, no, I don't like one of the violins. Uh, because it is too soft sounding, too sweet sounding for the rest. So I'm going to make a new instrument which will sound that little bit bolder so that it fits in with the sound quality of the rest of your instruments a bit better. And that is when my violin eventually came to me uh, because I got the violin which was deemed a little bit too timid for the string quartet and I absolutely loved it. So I was very, very lucky, but I had to wait for a long time uh, before it came my way and I'm still playing after all these years I'm still playing this instrument and I'm still loving the sound so um, miracles do happen <laughs> sometimes but by all means go to your local violin maker and go and try some instrument just explain to them um, what you're looking for and how much you're willing to spend obviously there's, there's that side of it as well and um, <clears throat> I'm sure they will be able to help you because what they want is that you are completely happy with the instrument that you play on and it gives you it gives me so much pleasure from a choice that I made about 40 years ago maybe uh, that it is well worth to to keep on persevering and looking for uh, an instrument that you absolutely fall in love with and you hear this from big big um soloists as well once they and and usually when people play on strads and things um usually they are on loan from people who own these instruments or from museums who own these instruments or from music colleges or other other institutions that own the instruments um there comes a time when people need to be parted from their violins and it's sometimes very very hard Right, enough about that. Actually, let me add one thing to that. Because <coughs> we can have a very good violin. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but we have to have a bow to match to bring out the beautiful sound of the violin. And when people buy a violin, I always warn them and say to them, be careful that for a bow a bow and a violin to be a matching pair um the bow needs to be about a quarter to a third of the value in of the instrument because it is no use having a, a Stradivarius violin and you buy your cheapest bow on Amazon because the bow is not able to get that beautiful sound out of the Stradivarius violin you see so you'd have to have a bow which is very subtle in uh, and uh, which is able to bring out all those wonderful tone colors that an instrument like that can produce so uh, the bow and the violin should be a matching pair in that sense as well so when you're upgrading your violin be aware that you might be upgrading your bow at the same time and then as you upgrade your instrument to a better quality one it may well be that your musical instrument insurance will say oh hang on a minute um, any old case is not good enough. I can remember when I got this one, my insurance said you need a carbon fiber case, which was another big, big, big expense. And I'm sure that a lorry can drive over my case and not break it. Uh, but you know, uh, that be prepared that there may be other uh, secondary costs involved as well. Right. Is there anything else that someone might want to ask? <laughs> Thanks, Rob. You say, what a story. Thanks for sharing. I love that story. And I have to <laughs> add that um, shortly after I got this instrument, I was on the train with my violin teacher and um, I dropped the violin, which was in its case. <laughs> So that was not the best moment. I can never forget his face. Um, how do you know if the bow is a matching pair? That's a very good question. And the 
um, the biggest criterion is is perhaps the price here and especially when you're learning it's very hard to judge isn't it now any good violin maker would tell you whether the bow is flexible enough whether it is subtle enough because that has any everything to do with the quality of the wood of the stick and the way it is shaped so where the biggest curvature is and also how the weight is distributed on the bow and i i wouldn't it would be beyond my expertise to give you finer detail about that but uh, a good violin maker will be able to tell you this bow matches that violin or this bow does not match that violin um, it depends on the sort of quality of course i was talking extremes here um the stradivarius violin and the amazon bow uh, and and I'm sure that nobody in their right mind would even think about combining the two. But once you get into the more um, in the more shall we say expressive instruments, in the more high value instruments, the high value bows go with those. Wow. Kersey said, my Harold Lawrence number two is 900 euros and the 7 8 same level is 1200 euros. Wow, now that is news to me. Of course, I'm not up to date with the prices in euros, um, but maybe, just maybe, because you're not paying by the size. It's not that a quarter of instrument is always cheaper than a half size instrument. Um, but what is the case? It's probably, you say the same level, but it probably has a few more tone colours because that price difference is is huge, isn't it? And then, of course, you want to have a 7 8 bow, although I can imagine that you want you can play with your full-size bow on the 7 8 violin uh, because the more bow you use on an instrument, the better your sound is. So... Uh, wow, that comes as a shock to me and to Richard. I can see that as well, Rob. Uh, to Rob as well. Rob says, wow. Yeah, Matt, I, I'm interested to hear from you. Maybe next time you can let me know um, if, you've, if you've got your 7 8 size violin, whether it is proved right that the value is much more than the other one. Um, of course... Well, I'm saying, of course, I, I would assume that 7-8 violins are perhaps a bit more scarce than full-size violins. I don't know, because that is um, maybe a localised thing as well. Maybe in your area, there are relatively more 7-8 violins. I know from speaking to violin makers that at some point, half-size and three-quarter violins were very, very hard to come by. And I think that's eased a little bit now where I live. <clears throat> but the violin was proving to be a very, very popular instrument for children to play in school. So lots and lots of violins of those sizes um, were taken up by people. And, and the market is just like that. If, if something gets scarce, the price will go up. So who knows that that might be the case in, in with your 7-8 violin as well. But I'd be most interested to hear if you find a more difficult more easy to play on the 7 8 violin uh, and how you like the sound by comparison to your full size instrument because i would expect the sound to be a little bit softer in as in less full but maybe it's slightly less loud but it has more tone color and those are two completely different things the volume of a sound is very different from the subtleties in tone in what sort of character it can do can you play different um diff we call them tone colors but you could you could imagine different colors in light and darkness in tone um so i'd be most interested to hear next time let me know <laughs> Is there anything else? Perhaps about playing technique? Perhaps about pieces that you play? Rob, another practice question. How to control involuntary face mimics when playing? Very, very good question. And that is that is something that some people just do, isn't it? People who've got really into it. It's like um, when you 
are doing your very best when children draw and and they're doing their very best their tongues might come out of their mouths a little bit and it's the same with musicians as well i mean you have these pianists who can do excessive movements while they play uh, what we want to do and and violinists sometimes make faces when they play in cellists as well and i'm not talking about the learned expressions of sort of pretending to to be carried away with your music but involuntary things um that is a kind of energy that we want to see if we can get rid of uh, in our faces or wherever it manifests in your body some people play with very very tight legs very stiff legs and they really squeeze their knees uh, or even their hands and um so we want to come away from those external pressures that manifest in any part of your body and we want to see if we can channel that sort of eagerness shall i call it or you could call it muscle tension we want to try and challenge it to being more expressive on your instrument and we and just thinking about it that way might be the first step to trying to get rid of involuntary mimicking in your face in, in maybe in your case maybe in somebody you know's case uh, one thing that you can do and this is a little bit silly but becoming aware of it is the first step so obviously you've made that first step and trying to feel where in your body it manifests is a very useful thing then if it manifests in your face i'd normally do this with a straw i haven't got a straw here what you might do is just put a pen in your mouth like this. <laughs> this video will now stay on YouTube with me with a pen in my mouth. But the point I'm making is that you want to start to feel when you're moving your lips or your face or your eyes. People do this as well sometimes in their playing. Um, and, and you want to perhaps hold this straw with your lips really gently and then you feel how relaxed you can be with your lips and with your mouth and still play because we want to come away from needing that tension to play better because we want to channel that tension into your instrument and becoming more expressive so while you encourage your face to relax by means of the straw and you might breathe in and out through the straw like that while you play at the same time you might want to um, try and play more expressively on your instrument now what do i mean by that you can start by adding more louds and softs so make much more difference try to get them the two out out of each other away from each other a little bit so make your soft softer and your loud playing louder so that we encourage more expression in your playing and another way to get more expression in your playing is to start thinking of images and that is a bit of a an abstract thought uh, but when we play certain sections in music it might sometimes remind you of things the title of your piece might also sometimes remind you of what of something now um let's see uh, Kersey was talking about the May song so you might let's let's take this as an example the May song and then Kersey might perhaps experiment with that in her piece of music as well so the first thing I'm, I'm going to ask you is that what what reminds is there something that the title May song reminds you of does it remind you of spring does it remind you of blossom does it remind you of fresh colors does it remind you about hanging out your washing i'm just brain brainstorming ideas and one idea might work for you and another idea might work for the next person and so when you play may song and you've got this image of let's say apple blossom in your piece the next piece when you play and it's called stormy night you might play about something else think about the colors gray and black and hailstones and and things i bet you you're going to play your piece differently 
So finding images to play in your music will help you together with the straw to be less expressive here and more expressive there. And you're saying, I auditioned with a teacher and she said I had to control it. <laughs> that's that's all very well. I, I can say to my pupils, you've got to control it, but how you do it, did she say how to do it? I think, I think you've got to A, recognise that it's there, B, recognise that it is tension, that you want to channel into expression, turn that tension into expression, and then find ways to enhance your expression. And people think, think differently, don't they? Some people think in colours. So you might have, you might go to a paint shop and get a colour chart and define your pieces and think, okay, I've got 15 different shades of green. Um, my May song, what sort of green am I going to think about when I play? And can I play this green today slightly differently from another colour that I pick from the colour chart tomorrow and another one the day after tomorrow? Or do you think more in browns? So that is one way people think in colours sometimes. Other people think in feelings. So um, a bit more of a harsh feeling or a little bit more of a gentle feeling or a very loving feeling. Any of those sorts of expressions, whatever works for you, is good. And in my early days of my teaching career, I used to have a whole box full of old calendars with pretty pictures, pretty cottages and landscapes and mountains and things and that sometimes helps trigger those emotions and those expressions that you might want to convey with your music so you find you find a pretty picture that goes well with the expression that you want in your piece and this way i think we get a very individual style of playing and that is what music is about. It gets very boring, especially for me as a teacher. When I teach a May song to 15 different people, if they all play like robots in exactly the same way. Um, so I always tend to encourage people to find those expressions, find ways of different ideas of how to play a piece. And that goes for every level of playing. It also goes for every level of instrument. The way you can actually let your violin help you create the sort of value that you want to put on a piece is, is of course a slightly different thing so i'm hoping that long story helps you and again i'd be most interested if next time we can come back to this and you can tell me um if that has worked and it takes practice it doesn't come overnight you can't say oh i've tried it today and it didn't work give it a go for the next four or five weeks or so and see um, good idea with the pictures and colours. Yeah, give it a go and uh, let me know. Be really good. Any more questions? Well, let me know if you've got any more things. We've got a couple more minutes, but... Um, this is enough food for thought, I think, already for today. What do you think about teaching Gavotte? Now, perhaps you can expand a little bit on that question because there are many different Gavottes that I teach. <laughs> um, teacher said that she didn't because it was too difficult for book one. Okay, yeah, I can see why somebody might say that, but then what I always like to do is to really challenge people. And sometimes I am surprised. I think people can't do something, which is which is a, a red flag for me. If, if I start to think as a teacher that somebody might not be able to do it. Of course, um, when you play in book one and you then go and skip a whole lot of stuff and go to book five, that, that is a red flag. You shouldn't do that. But I am always very worried about saying, you shouldn't do that because it's too hard. At least give it a go and see how it works out because it might be that a penny just suddenly drops and that you've always 
taken incremental steps in getting slightly more difficult, it doesn't mean to say that if you skip two steps, it is still too difficult, you see? So I think you, you should deserve the benefit of the doubt and just have a go and explore without, without setting your standards too high. Just see what it is like. And a little anecdote maybe from earlier when I was learning to play the bar solo sonatas, I really wanted to play one of the solo sonatas that I heard on television, that I'd seen on television. And I tried it and it was the Chacon by Bach. And um, I think I couldn't work out the first two chords. So I knew then that I couldn't do that. And that at that time, it was too hard. Uh, but that doesn't have to stop you from trying. So what you might do is start with the first line try it a few times and see if you can analyze if you get stuck somewhere why you get stuck and see if you can solve that issue and then see if you can get a little bit further you see without actually saying straight away no that's too hard give it a go and see where you end up because i really am a great believer of violin playing that goes two steps forward one step back two steps forward one step back so whilst you may not be able to perform it anytime soon there's nothing wrong with just giving it a go and sort of laying the foundations accepting that maybe it is too difficult for you um, but then when you come back to it in a year's time or so you might think oh oh yes i tried it and um i did get a few things right then you see that's a different approach um, so good luck with that. And again, <laughs> let me know next time. We've got, we've got a whole new conversation again next time, I think. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for your patience and for turning up here and staying right until the end. I've really enjoyed all the relevant questions that you've asked and I'm hoping that I have given a satisfactory answer. So two more things. Um, remember to visit the new shop, especially when you live in the USA. The new shop is now live on my website proamstrings.com and you can, rather than go to the Amazon shop, you can find all the products there. It's also been slightly updated with some new things there as well. And then if you want to send a video, just asking a question, uh, and there is a very lovely video to come next Friday. It will go live on YouTube um, about the left uh, about how to um, about how to structure your practice, and that is a very useful subject, I think, for somebody. So, if you want to be part of the violin clinic and send me your video, send it to info at proamstrings.com, and then. I wish you all the best with your violin playing. Oh, let's find a different date. Let's see if the people who are here, let me have a look at my calendar. Let's find a date, a Friday towards the end of November. It can be the 18th or the 25th. Let's go from for the 25th of November. That will be the date of our next live class, 25th of November, 2022. Thank you all very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the Pro Am Strings YouTube channel and I'll see you again in the live class on the 25th of November. Goodbye everyone.